Common Mystic Prayer, Gabriel Diefenbach Chapter 10 A Fear Removed The apparent inactivity and repose of the faculties in contemplative and mystic prayer will at once raise a question in some minds as to the deception of quietism. The writer can recall the cautious fears of a person whom God was long calling to the repose of contemplation. But isn't there a danger? How can I be certain I am not falling into quietism? When the question was put point blank, what is quietism? The person answered in humble confusion, I do not know. One might, of course, confuse the quiet of the faculties in contemplation with the error of quietism. The very expressions employed offer basis for the confusion. But nothing could be further from the truth because the powers are in repose, and it is not to be concluded that the soul is inactive. On the contrary, the soul is active, with a simplified activity coming from the inmost being, in which the will, from its depths, adheres to God. It is like an act of faith made in the higher parts of the soul and imperceptible to the senses. This simple movement of the will in adhering to God is the very highest activity. Contemplation is at once repose and intense action. In this, it faintly resembles a characteristic of the divine being, who, though he is pure activity, remains forever undisturbed in unchangeable repose. In his study, The Graces of Interior Prayer, Pierre Poulain writes, Quietists teach all action is an imperfection and that the immobility of our faculties must therefore be an ideal toward which all our endeavors should tend. Hence the name quietists. But because the prayer of simplicity has been thus extolled by the quietists, we need not conclude that it is dangerous, for we should then fall blindly into a snare set for us by the devil. When he cannot make a direct attack upon practices that are inspired by God, he tries to bring them into discredit by exaggerations or an admixture of falsehood. These practices thus become suspected even by well-intentioned persons who have not the leisure or the talent to separate the good grain from the tares. There are many angles to the quietest error, all of which may be reduced to this root tenet. The divine being can be experimentally found or perceived in our consciousness if only we remove all obstacles. The word to be noted here is experimentally. A definition often given of mystical prayer is that it is an experimental knowledge of God, a kind of perception of God in the soul. Doubtless, he is ever truly present to the soul in grace, but a conscious perception and enjoyment of him cannot be had by the soul's unaided powers. This requires the added touch of the finger of God when and as He pleases. To force an artificial and self-imposed quiet upon mind and imagination, no action of divine grace intervening, leaves the soul wholly inactive. It does nothing itself, and it receives nothing from God. It is His action that must draw the soul to repose, and move it to act in a higher way. There is a break between meditation and contemplation, the latter being the result of a new action of grace. And though the beginnings of mystic prayer may not be easily perceptible, the direct part played by God in it should be recognizable by all. The quietist, however, denies this very thing, at least implicitly. If we can experience contact with divinity simply by removing all obstacles, mystical prayer will be considered exclusively as the achievement of our own personal effort. For this reason, quietest writers placed such strong emphasis on the negative side of asceticism, the utmost stripping of self-activity. This was extended particularly to the activities of mind and will, not only all thoughts, imaginations, and reflections were to be cast out, but the will itself must cease to desire. 
This was carried to such an absurd extreme as to include the desire for sanctity and even salvation. One must not even strive for virtue or resist temptation. The error in this is evident. In genuine contemplative prayer, it is true, the action of God gradually absorbs that of the soul. But the will must ever exercise its own activity in cooperating, giving unceasing content to God's action. Some quietists rejected even this consent as being activity, and therefore worthless. All writers, both orthodox and quietist, insist on the clearing away of the obstacles to divine union. A main purpose of ascetic practice is to subject the appetites and passions to the control of reason. Included in this is the aim of curtailing sense activity with a view to establishing the soul in peace for its meeting with God in prayer. Such is surely the most fitting preparation for spiritual contact with the purity and simplicity of the divine being. It is a training in evangelical perfection. But further than this, the soul cannot go of itself. It must await the action of grace as this reveals itself in a new manner. Here is the saving reason for the three signs. What preserves one from quietism is precisely their simultaneous presence. They indicate the divine action, and if the soul had not this justification, its faculties would indeed be idle, empty, quietistic. But the quietist ignores any signs. He goes by his own action, which procedure is a brand of self-hypnosis. In true contemplation, it is the action of grace which draws the soul to loving repose in God. There is another point of reassurance on the practical side. The test of prayer is its effect on daily life. Advance in virtue, horror of sin, remorse at willful faults imply a good prayer. The will derives power from it, and a false prayer could not produce such results. The quietist, on the other hand, is likely to fall away from virtuous living. He gets nothing from God. His strength is from himself, which accounts for the notable aberrations and moral lapses in the lives of some outstanding advocates of quietism. But here, as always, false doctrine is best dispelled by exposition of the true. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 Two Virtues In view of the preceding, it is well to say a few words on those virtues that are unquestionably most essential for souls advancing on the path of interior union with God. The two to be stressed are humility and obedience. On these rests the very foundation of all spiritual life. Without them, our supernatural life would have neither truth nor security, and we should soon lose our way in a wilderness of pride and self-love. Now it is an evident fact, clearly reflected in the lives of all holy and Christ-like persons, that the necessary predisposition for the reception of God's gifts and graces is humility of heart. He that is a little one, let him come to me. Where humility is, there also is wisdom. And it may be truly said that where God does not find at least the beginnings of this fundamental virtue, or the effort to attain it, He will refrain from communicating those gifts with which He so ardently longs to adorn the human soul. Indeed, it is a kind of law in the kingdom of God that all ascent and approach to his throne is by way of the ladder of humility. And the greater the saint in the kingdom, the more deeply penetrated is his soul with the lovely virtue. It is humility that not only attracts the heart of men, but endears the soul to God, arresting his loving glance so that he beholds it with divine complacency. Behold the handmaid of the Lord said the humblest and meekest of all God's creatures, she who is the most richly endowed, the jewel of all creation. And even the sacred humanity of Jesus paid the price as a condition, so to speak, of its unique gift of hypostatic union with the second person of the Godhead 
by an unparalleled humility and humiliation. Wherefore, St. Paul could wish nothing better for the Christian and child of God. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, though he was by nature God, did not consider being equal to God a thing to be clung to, but emptied himself, taking the nature of a slave, and being made like unto men. And appearing in the form of man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even to death on a cross. Therefore, God has exalted him and has bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that in the name of Jesus every knee should bend of those in heaven, on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the glory of God the Father. The further advanced we are in the supernatural life, and the nearer we are to God, the humbler in all truth we must be. Every devout person, then, will naturally beg for this most engaging virtue of humility. Such a course will save many a one from going astray. For, in contrast to the darkness that inevitably follows in the wake of pride, the wisdom that comes with humility enlightens the soul. And if we do perceive some gift or grace in ourselves, as the saints could not help but observe in themselves, we, like them, will disclaim anything as our own, except sin and misery, but will lay the gift to the sheer mercy of infinite goodness. Where the prayer is true and persevering, moreover, humility will appear as a fruit. It is indeed an unfailing work of spiritual prayer to beget this virtue in proportion to its own advance. The deeper the prayer union, the deeper the humility. The sense of helplessness in the powers of the soul, a feeling even that its spirituality is gone, as well as a perception of its shortcomings, due to closer contact with God, tend to keep it humble. Finding little of the satisfaction it once did in many spiritual activities, the soul is more likely to be cast down at sight of its own poverty and to consider others better than itself. This causes the soul to lose, too, its former deep attachment to its own ideas of spirituality and goodness, and instead to feel embarrassed at a word of praise. Besides, any falls and imperfections that may occur at this stage will further maintain it in loving humility. The twin virtue to humility is obedience. It may even be considered as a phase or offshoot of humility insofar as obedience is humility of mind, submission of will and judgment to another. It is precisely this submission to ecclesiastical and spiritual authority that preserves the Christian from error. Many have fallen, as in the case of the quietists, who perhaps had notable qualities and distinctions, but they lacked obedience to lawful authority. Wherever this occurs, wherever there is contempt and disdain for the guidance that God has willed to set up in this world, there too is illusion loss of the way, and, not infrequently, permanent disaster. Such deceptions have often been known in the matter of private inspirations, visitations, communications, and revelations. All genuinely holy souls will, as the saints have done, in every instance refer whatever personal communications and spiritual experiences they may receive, whatever be the message to the proper guide and authority in God's holy church. Any deviation on this point is sure sooner or later to lead to error, if not in doctrine, at least in practice. Suppose, then, some inspiration comes by way of prayer. This is the moment to remember that the ecclesiastical or religious superior is the representative of God for those under his or her care. Therefore, Obedience to the superior is obedience to God. But what if God demands one thing in prayer and the superior, incredulous, demands the opposite? 
no doubt God, knowing our reluctance to obey, may on occasion prompt something which he knows the superiors will not permit. In this case, what he really wants is the sacrifice of one's will, which is the supreme act of personal adoration that can be offered to him. Therefore, always presupposing there is no question of sin, we must undoubtedly obey our superiors. We are never so sure of inspirations we think divine as of the commands of lawful authority, wherein the will of God is plainly signified to us. Such was the instruction of our Lord to St. Margaret Mary. He told her on one occasion that he would adjust his graces to the spirit of the rule, to the will of her superiors, and that she must regard with suspicion anything that would withdraw her from exact obedience. And he further bade her to prefer her superior's orders to his, saying that he would know how to accomplish his designs in his own way. He who hears you, hears me, he said to those who bear his authority, and the truly humble and spiritual soul will abase itself under all rather than trust to its own unenlightened guidance. Even St. John of the Cross, outstanding teacher in spiritual and contemplative matters though he was, humbly wrote in the prologue to his work, I accept the aid of experience and learning, and if through ignorance I should err, it is not my intention to depart from the sound doctrine of our Holy Mother, the Catholic Church. I resign myself absolutely to her light and submit to her decisions, and moreover to the better judgment herein of private men, be they who they may. The soul, then, can make no mistake in obedience. On occasion it may receive unsuitable advice, but where no sin is involved, it acts rightly in obeying. It is a very easy thing for God to bring the soul in the providential path of one who will give the needed counsel, and he does this frequently. Meanwhile, victory is granted to the humble and obedient heart. End of chapter 11